I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, the host and creator of the True Crime South Africa podcast. If you caught the first episode of White Lies on Mnet last night, then you, like me, are probably already hooked. Over the next eight weeks, I'll be taking you through each and every episode, analyzing the information we're given, using the knowledge that I've gained from covering almost 150 cases on the podcast, so we can figure out who the White Lies killer is. The question is, are we ready for the truth? Good investigators always start by understanding the victims. It's called victimology. Almost 80% of murders are committed by offenders known to the victims, and the victim's background can tell you a lot about who might want to kill them. Victim number one, Andrew McKenzie. Deceased, gunshot wound to the head. Occupation, businessman in the property field. Husband to Olivia. Father to Daniel and Jamie. Estranged brother to Edie Hansen. Victim number two, Olivia McKenzie. Critical condition, blunt force trauma to the head. Occupation, housewife. Wife to Andrew, mother to Daniel and Jamie. Last call on her cell phone, Edie Hansen. Scenario, home invasion. Unlikely, as there was no forced entry, but many home invasions are as a result of insider information from employees. The killer was either known to the victims and they let him or her in, or they were already inside the house. Familicide. Familicides are homicides in which a family member murders one or more members of their family in a single incident. This option is very much on the table. Most familicides are psychologically motivated by revenge, but can also have financial motives, where life insurance policies are involved. And I'm guessing families living in Bishop's Court would not have small life insurances. And that's without the enormous estates that get tacked onto that. Of course, there's a third option. And that is that it was someone close to them, but for a different reason. Business? A personal grudge? With humans, the options are endless. Our brilliant and embattled detective, Forty Bell, has his work cut out for him. But it seems he's already latched himself onto the idea that this was a familicide. Not impossible, But those blinders can be dangerous, and Edie is prepared to rip those blinders right off. So, let's have a look at our suspects. Who has motive, means, and opportunity? Daniel McKenzie, son to the victims. He may have motive, he would benefit significantly financially from the murders. Means... Could he get his hands on a gun? Very possible. Money talks, right? Opportunity? Absolutely. Current suspect rating? 4 out of 5. Jamie McKenzie. As with her brother, she ticks all three boxes. It seems clear that Forty sees her more as an accessory, though. But Sam will tell, I guess. If there's anything I've learned... It's that you should never discount a suspect based on what you think you know about them. Fifteen-year-old girls can be just as dangerous as adult men with the right, or wrong, circumstances. Edie, though, doesn't believe her niece and nephew did it, and she quickly points the finger at the Mackenzie's employee. Pearl housekeeper to the Mackenzie family. Does she have motive? It could be financial, or she could have a grudge against the family we don't know about yet. Means, we don't know yet. 
But in most murders in which employees are involved, they're just the middlemen and don't actually commit the murders themselves. So, means remains under investigation, at least by Edie, if not 40. And finally, opportunity. Absolutely. She lives on the property and would have the same access as the children. Current suspect rating, 3 out of 5. Of course, a case against a suspect is built on far more than just these three things. The evidence, both circumstantial and physical, also has to point somewhere. And with the cameras having been turned off, which again could have been done by any of the three identified suspects so far, we only have eyewitness testimony from Pearl pointing to Daniel and Jamie. Not looking good for them right now. Toward the end of the episode, though, we have at least one new person of interest pop up. Vanna Weber, the Mackenzie's neighbour. Now, Vanna is definitely still only at person of interest level right now, and not a suspect yet. He's pretty creepy and arrogant, but that doesn't make him a killer. That final scene, though? Having sex in a bloody crime scene with his wife, Nonzi? Pretty big red flag. Not to kink shame, but let's face it. Some of the most infamous killers in history have gone back to the scene of the crime for sexual gratification. Motive? Unknown at this point. Means? Again, money can buy means. Opportunity? Well... If he can access the Mackenzie's house for an afternoon romp, I'm pretty sure he could access it to commit murder. The other aspect of a murder investigation our friend Forty is going to have to look at is alibi. And none of these suspects have one. At least, not as far as we know. So that's what we have so far. And if that is what episode one has to offer... We're in for a wild ride. Is the killer stalking Edie as she watches her brother's neighbours doing some pretty interesting stuff in a crime scene? We'll have to wait until next week to find out. Be sure to be in front of your television on Thursday at 8pm and join me back here on Friday for another analysis as we figure out if we're really ready for the truth.